we're almost pretty early. <laughs> so make yourselves at home. I kind of want to know uh, who my audience is. That's the first rule of digital. Um, to know who you're talking to, so you know what to say. So, who are you all? Like, who's who's TV? Who's TV? Oh, oh, okay. Who's radio? Okay. Uh, what kind of digital stuff do you already do? Give me some ideas. We have our core website. Okay. Is part of what we do. Great. Uh, mobile is part of that strategy. The Obviously. website that is responsive on mobile or an app. Uh, it's an app. Okay. We have two apps. We have a news app uh, that we primarily feed, and then we have a partnership with the weather company that creates our weather oh, app. Nice. And do you do push notifications? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you do too many push All notifications? Time. I don't think so. I think okay. we've got a nice balance. Um, That's like know, the, it's like the primarily, it's local breaking news, what folks need to know about. Obviously, severe weather alerts um, are a big deal. Um, but um, the company also does, I think, kind of company wide, we're part of Next Star, 190 plus TV stations. So um, Peter Scolari, the actor from yeah. Boys and Buddies died yesterday. Yep. We had a push alert go out. Okay. I think that was corporate. Yeah, right. Yeah. You're like, so, I didn't well, never report that myself. Out of Baldwin, <laughs> uh, shooting uh, Thursday night. Right. Um, that was they pushed push through out. the app. Okay. Okay, so website, mobile app. What other types of digital things we have going on? Well, if it's for advertisers, Tim's a radio guy, and, and, uh, and Dave's a TV guy, but, but Tim, t t Tim's a big radio, a big radio company, and they're doing a lot of great things. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're spread that thin, you have a large, do you have a digital staff, either of you? Uh, yes. So, and they, that's what they do. Four, um, four positions. Just get a feel. We also, um, and Chuck Williams is with us, but Chuck is one of our four podcast hosts. We do weekly podcasts, our right. uh, main mail anchor, our sports guys do one every other week. Everybody loves good sports podcasts. Um, yes, our uh, chief neurologist does kind of a health, lifestyle, um, fitness, whatever he wants. <laughs> Isn't that true though? Like some people have products and it's just like whatever you want to do, that's fine. And someone will listen. But he's really, he's really good. If they're he does a lot of deep dives, you know, maybe you know, a big story of that week. Okay. We'll bring a guest in and you know, for a good hour, really dig into that. Sometimes it's just newsmakers that we want to yeah, spend so a little time with, that's right? That's something that uh, I've got four members of my news team here and um, really proud of what they've done this year to add that. We've got a digital yeah, studio. And look at an encouraging everything. manager. Yeah. Like, let's yeah, clone you and spread you out to everyone. So these are our overachievers. Um, they get they get a good start today. Okay. <laughs> what, what other kind of digital stuff are we looking at here? Like, what what are you on doing, trying? Nice. And how is that going? Are you in the early stages? Because that's kind they're, of a, a newer. Yeah, they're, they're, every time we get a sign up, we try to get your telephone number because we can see your push on the telephone. And doing news updates through text. Yeah, we have that far. Okay, you're yeah. building your database. Yeah, totally, yeah. Yes. Right? And so the, the, the text thing, I think, is such an interesting, I mean, I think it can easily go too far, right? I, you know, the, the personal and the professional are such a weird space with digital because it's just like spaghetti. Everything's laying on everything else. Um, but there is a sense in which I will pay attention to a text message, but I can ignore an email for days, <laughs> right? Like if I put my mind to it. Mm -hmm. Texting is so immediate, it's personal. Um, and so I think, you know, finding the tonality there is going to be important, but I love that you're trying it. We know it's working for voter registration, right? We know, I mean, there's some success, um, you know, research-based. What other kind of digital tools are we using? Like you can't outweigh me. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? All the 
positions, but yeah. you know, play them with it in different ways, like they were saying with the, with the podcast, because the podcast will, a clip will go out on Twitter, like the podcast that I do this week, the guys that are going to make some modifications to what work for some Chattanooga River, you know, had a, it had WRBL, it's on um, various Apple, Spotify, all that, but then we did a new story out of it using the podcast interview. So, I mean, it literally was in every one Spiders, of right? Yeah. It's like that Rob the History Ratio. Yeah, it's just everywhere. And, that, and social media is a huge part of driving people in this way. So, I always wonder, and this is so great to get this feedback from you all, because sometimes I talk to audiences, and I'll explain who I am here in a minute, I promise. But, like, sometimes I'll talk to audiences, and they're just starting to get some digital going, right? And then other times I'll talk to audiences, and they're doing all the digital things, but they're also feeling overwhelmed and exhausted by it because technically everything could technically go everywhere, right? And it is, it's like, okay, like, so where do we put this? Um, and where do we focus our energy? And how do we make good quality content and not just throw stuff out into the ethos like crazy hoping someone will click on it, right? And how does this affect our bottom line? Which by the way, can't answer that question for you ultimately. Like I'll give you like a couple thoughts that we've you know, found through some of our work, but um, you know, I was talking to some other folks downstairs earlier, you know, the return on investment on digital is just, it's cagey right now, you know, because our business model is kind of cagey right now. And so uh, figuring that out is, is gonna be part of this puzzle. Um, I am, I'm Amanda Bright from the University of Georgia. Uh, I started working in newspapers when I was 15, covering county fairs, you know, like, so like, I'm one that, that kid, I wanted to know what I, I wanted to be a journalist from age 10 on. Um, and I hustled my way into my local newspaper. Uh, went to the University of Illinois, I got a journalism degree, I've worked in dailies, weeklies, um, some metro papers. Um, I have been a reporter, a photographer, an editor, a uh, designer, um, and then I figured out the website thing was probably going to work for people, and so I learned how to be a web developer, and then I learned how to do social media content for nonprofits, and then I think about a PhD. I have an attention span issue. <laughs> okay? okay? But clearly, but. <laughs> What we're doing now, so I'm at the University of Georgia, and I'm, um, I'm working with our journalism students, which we hope you've hired them. Um, and we're trying to figure out what to do next to help y'all push everything forward and to go where we need to go and to do what we need to do. Um, so that's where like my research is, but that's where my practical life is too. So I don't know if you've heard of Grady News Source. Um, it, is our, um, it is our broadcast. If you've ever, you ever, has anyone ever seen Grady News Source? Has anyone ever heard this music? Do you have it in your cell phone? Uh, I think you do. No. Um, completely student done and student led. On Grady News Source at 5. As Athens Clark County residents face eviction for unpaid rent, the county's relief program to keep them in their homes is still undecided. Madison County prepares for Mental Health Awareness Week with a special symbol. And later, a deeper look into the COVID virus to residents across North Georgia. Mm -hmm. and Some of you know Jodi Cantrell, right? She's, well, she's, I kind of want to be like her when I grow up. <clears throat> um, she hasn't grown up, so that's I know, <laughs> right? So we're, uh, I'm on the right path. Um, they run the, the TV side, a little more specifically. I am the managing editor of News Source, so I run 10 digital products. And we have about 100 editorial employees every semester. Talk about onboarding. Every semester is 100 new kiddos that are served as our editorial staff. And they do the live by broadcast, they do specialty shows, um, but we are really doing a lot of uh, um, multi-platform storytelling that crosses every single boundary you could possibly think of. And so when they're publishing on our website, they're doing stories with text, audio, interactive graphics, some basic coding stuff, I teach design as well, um, interactives. Um, we have uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we just added TikTok. Right. about how that's going later too long. <laughs> we have an app that does push notifications, um, and we have an email newsletter that goes out every week that kind of curates some of our content. So our job is to kind of do what you're talking about in some ways, which is kind of throw everything at the wall and see what sticks, but we find it very disheartening too. <laughs> um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today specifically, um, through a program I'm doing that I'm gonna pitch to you as well, um, is 
what is maybe working better than other things. I think we're getting to the point in the digital world where like all the shiny things are happening and now some things are rising to the top, right? Um, and I, I wanna make an argument today that we probably shouldn't be doing all the things. Um, I don't know that your marketing broadcast or your marketing sales team is gonna necessarily like that concept, but I think in editorial, we have to be really wise about the decisions that we make and where we invest. So I'm, I have some thoughts about that based on what my students have been doing. Um, and what we've been doing with, with news organizations. So let me just give you a sense of where a lot of this information is coming from. Um, I have a program, we're gonna be in our second year, called Digital Natives. This is actually a program that came out of Mizzou, but we took it and, and kind of did something a little bit different with it. Uh, what we do is we have news organizations in Georgia who have a specific one or two digital goals. Like, I would like to increase our newsletter, click over it or I would like to build a Facebook group to have more interaction with my audience, or I would like to uh, create more YouTube interaction, or maybe more views, or more streaming, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, it's kind of a specific digital goal. We find a student who knows how to do that well. We send them to you for a week in January. They implement a plan and train and figure out how to help launch whatever that is. Uh, and then they leave you with a playbook for how to kind of continue that on. The cool thing about digital natives is that um, they spend a week in your newsroom, so it's a really good opportunity for them to see what Georgia newsrooms are like. Um, this because sometimes they're all like, New York City, you know? Uh, and we're like, hey, there's a lot of really good work that can be done here and now. Um, and it allows you to take, you know, like that extra time that you don't have and have someone do something for you specifically to advance a digital goal. The cool thing is it's free. So we pay the students $1,000, and we also pay their hotel, transportation, and food for the entire week's day, and they do two months of research and training and planning leading up to that week's day. So I'll tell you about the program and how you can apply later. That's kind of like my subtext, but I want to be like upfront because I'm a journalist. I don't want to be like trying to sell you something, right? But this is where we kind of figured out a lot of this stuff in our first round of digital natives for, for where we can kind of like dial down and think about audience engagement. So y'all familiar with this? The CNN web of digital products. Have you ever seen this? So Kendall Trammell, she runs mobile for CNN, is one of our alums, and I always just, I just marvel at this thing. Like whenever I open it up. These are all the different CNN digital products. So they have kind of like four echelons. Um, they have the mobile web, the mobile app, the desktop, and CNN Go, right? And a little bit, some of this is a little bit dated. It's changed, but it changes all the time. And these are their core kind of digital products. Then they have their video platforms. Okay, YouTube, um, you guys talked about uh, OTT, right? Roku, Apple TV, and things like that. And obviously, nonlinear consumption of video and audio is way more preferable now because people don't want to wait till five o'clock or six o'clock or 10 o'clock. You know, they're not interested in that. Um, social and messaging, you know, a little bit of everything. Um, and obviously, TikTok is not on here, so that needs to be added. Um, eventually, and then some larger kind of experimental things, what it looks like on Apple Watch, Google Newsstand, Oculus Rift, Amazon Echo with voice recognition, some VR stuff that they're playing with, right? I bring this up because this seems like really good digital strategy, but only if you have thousands of people. Does anyone have thousands of people? Okay. Right, so me neither, like, you know, um, and so, What's cool about this is it's aspirational, but what's bad about this is it makes us feel like oh, we should be doing all the things an inch deep. And I don't know about you, but I think the general public is a little bit tired of an inch deep. Like they may not say it all the time, but the volume, it's like drinking from a fire hose, right? The information that they're getting every day. And I think what's really tending to perform well is thoughtful, deep, you know, you're talking about the podcast, you know, the deep dive, or right, or watching a Twitch conversation that's auxiliary that goes a little bit deeper. People are looking for depth again. Like I think, you know, cycles. Human beings always live in cycles. So although digital is all of these things, um, four kind of big takeaways that we've learned or we've thought about to really kind of drill down and figure out, okay, these are the digital things we should be doing. Here's what I came up with, and I'd love to hear your thoughts kind of as we go through these. So I have four takeaways for you today. Um, takeaway number one. Uh, your digital products are meeting a very specific segment of your audience, right? So the people who are on Instagram are not the people who are on Facebook. 
actually the people who are on Instagram are on Facebook, but they're not posting anything. They're just lurking, right? Um, or are not the people on YouTube, are not the people reading your email newsletter, are not the people, right? So these people be watching your podcasts. We live in a fragmented media ecosystem. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I just think it bears meaning to go, oh my goodness, everyone is getting a different slice of this pie, and they're getting it in different ways. Now, the original theory with digital was if everyone's getting a different slice, we need to make sure we put everything on all the slices, right? So we're putting whipped cream on every single slice to make sure everyone gets some whipped cream. And then we realize that some people don't actually, they have no interest in, in that. And if I'm looking at several channels, then I'm seeing the same post in multiple places or the same content in multiple ways. And audiences get mad. Have you noticed this? They get mad. Think about when you see the same so thing on Facebook, Twitter. you post the same thing on Twitter that you post on Facebook? No, same you don't. You don't. And here's why. People get aggravated because you're wasting their time because they've already seen it. Now, should you paste the same content? Very possibly if you're reaching the same audience, but I would use it differently. I would pick a different image. I would pull a different quote out from the recording. I would highlight a different fact, right? Because each platform is fundamentally different in who it's reaching and the tools that it uses to reach them. So this is something we're teaching our students all the time because they want to just schedule posts for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, right? Like, and they want to just go rapid fire. In general, those posts do not get good engagement. It feels like drinking from a fire hose. Instead, take the same content. Think about, is that person on Twitter is that I'm trying to reach with this story? And if so, what would they be most interested in this recording? It's a lot of thought and reflection that goes into that. Um, so, tailor well, decisions. With breaking news, though, that creates issues as far as getting it out and competitive issues and things like that. Yes, so I would say breaking news is probably a little bit different than a regular content push to a digital product. Um, although, I mean, I think if you if you take the um, Alec Baldwin, right, breaking news, I saw that in lots of different places, right? Yes. I mean, because it just exploded and, and it kind of came out slow, right, and it kind of you know, uh, peeled out over time. Um, what I would prefer, even in a breaking news situation, is to go to a different platform to hear a different part of that story that at least pulls me into the, the larger story, right? If I want to hear the full thing, I can go back to your website, go back to your station, go back to, but ultimately, my entry point from a digital product, I want to think about who's seeing it and what they're going to be most interested in. So what we talk about, and it, you totally don't have to like it or believe what I'm saying, by the way. Like, it's totally okay. But I love it. I have students that are in college. That's all they do. Um, <laughs> this is the concept that we play off of. It's called PAM. I always think of PAM from the office, but that's just me. PAM is the idea of journalism as a product that is specifically targeting a purpose, an audience, and a message. So who's on Facebook? Not, not, not me. I'm on Facebook. But who is the stereotypical person who consumes and posts a lot of material on Facebook? They might be. They're older. They're yes. They're, they got into the social media kind of kicking and screaming, and they've gotten used to Facebook, and they have not wanted to read. That's so true, right? Mm -hmm. So when I write a post on Facebook, that's who I'm thinking of. Now, I know there's the lurkers. There's the 18 to 25 lurkers. So like they're in there. Mm -hmm. But that's not where they're really consuming their news. This is where their news happens to run past them because their aunt shared it. That's probably fake anyway, right? You know, <laughs> so like that's not <laughs> Alt I go also teach news literacy, by the way. So I boy, do I have stories. So um, <clears throat> the PAM thing is really important. Every time you pick a digital product, you're thinking about it's PAM. Okay, so what's the purpose of this product? Who is the audience of this product? And what message do they most need to hear on this product? Which means an Instagram story is gonna be very different from a Facebook post, right? Who's on Twitter? Like, not personally, but who's the Twitter demographic? People that are me. People? <laughs> it's, it's like a bid call. Yeah, I mean, like, you've gotta, you've gotta be witty to survive on Twitter, right? You gotta have a way with the words. So, um, if you look at research-based demographics, because I do, because I'm a nerd, um, it is socioeconomically high, uh, upper class. It is journalists and politicians essentially talking to each other. Um, academics, um, it is very male and very white in general, although it doesn't always look like it. Now, there are subsets of Twitter that actually support communities that are different from that, but they're subsets. It's not the main, by the most part of Twitter, if that makes sense. Um, 
And you know, we think of Twitter like breaking news because it's fast, but it's it's kind of that, but it's it's for a specific demographic. You know, Instagram, it used to be 18 to 25, now it's like 18 to 45. Like my mid 40s people are getting in there and we're like, well, cool, we're Instagramming. You know, can you real, you know, and um and that is a very visual medium. It's all about the images. They have to be authentic, but they have to be beautiful. Right? Imagine that. <laughs> it's kind of hard to pull off, to be honest. And so every product has that cam. And so one of the big takeaways that we found is when we sent our kids into these newsrooms, when they started really thinking and reflecting on, okay, who's my audience? What do they want to hear about this specific piece of reporting or story? Let me package that, tailoring it in that way. Analytics improved dramatically, okay, across the board. Because we were talking to the right choir, right? <laughs> we were like, all oh, right, you, this is what you want to know. Now, there are always some swings and misses. With digital, that's going to happen. Okay, because there are always, you know, there's, there's a larger demographic than our stereotypes. Um, but in general, it tends to be the case. Uh, so I am a big advocate now of limiting the amount of platforms that you really spend a lot of time on. I think we can be everywhere, but should we, right? But should we? Should we really invest the couple different digital products that are really doing well and deep dive, post a lot, get good crafted content onto those? Or should we have a little bit everywhere? Right? I mean, that's something you have to, you have to decide for your newsroom. Um, but what we're seeing in general, and if you look at some of the, the uh, at some of our digital native products, um, some of the Pew research, you know, just to remind you what numbers look like, sometimes we forget. Where's everybody? They're on Facebook and YouTube. It's just a because we, because we think, I think everybody's on Twitter. You know why? Because I like Twitter. Right? And I think it's just important to remember where, where our people are. Um, I also just love the fact that next door is on this list. <laughs> okay? And I think that uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. I think it's important. Um, Reddit? Oh my gosh, my husband is a Redditor. Like, it's embarrassing. He'll be like, hey, like, I read this. And I'm like, can you please fact check that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, isn't the Wild West in there? <laughs> you know? But if that's the audience, segment that we want to grow. And I know everyone wants to grow their younger audience segment because that's how life works, right? Because those are the people that are going to pay money, subscribe next, own businesses. They're going to come up through the system. Thinking about how we want to do that very intentionally, I think is important. Now, who wants to fight with me? Let's go. I'm kidding. Any thoughts about this? Um, all of those that you're talking about in my generation is probably We're using YouTube less than any of them. I mean, I, the people I know that are my age aren't necessarily, don't have YouTube channels or subscribe to YouTube channels. You know, we're using Facebook, we're using Twitter, and we're using the podcast. I will argue that you're probably using YouTube more than you think on Facebook. For linking through to YouTube videos, you're watching YouTube videos on Facebook. Um, I think it's TikTok. You, you're TikToking? Is that what you're saying? I think they're TikToking. Who? The same. No, <laughs> they're fancy like. Maybe we should start a separate channel. I mean, there's, the younger reporters in our newsroom are trying to get me to do TikTok. Yeah. Because I do stupid stuff. I'm just oh, like, well, I, then you're perfect for TikTok. I, I, I mean, in, in, in my tag out, it's unique and stupid. So, sure. You know, they, were, they really are pushing me. They're saying, listen, let me make your camera one for kids. Or like, let me get you on TikTok. Yeah, so, let me just kind of back this up and talk about what this means maybe from a branding perspective, and this is going into a little bit what I'm going to talk about later, but one of the reasons why we strategically pick a demographic and we pursue that audience and we tell the story in the way that would make sense to them or impact their lives is because what we're trying to do with digital products in general is not make money, because that's not how they work. Most of the time, out of the bag, we're trying to build a brand and we're trying to build connections, very personal connections. So the thing with digital products is they're personal, they're intimate. They happen on a phone in the same space you get a text from your mom and your husband and your, you have your kids' pictures and you have, right? It's a very personal space. Um, and so one of the things that digital products allow us to do is to build relationship with our audience in a way that a standard product doesn't always do as well. It's a little more formal, it's a little bit more boxed in. Okay, and I mean that about newspapers just as much, just so you know. Like, um, 
So when we think about who we want to target, and you know, should you be on TikTok? Well, you know, maybe not on the day. But if you get some people, if you get something clever, I'm telling you what, TikTok rewards clever. Mm -hmm. And would they possibly check out your podcast because of it? Yeah, they might. Okay, it's not always a direct line, but it could build a personality, a brand, a loyalty, a relationship with a group that you haven't accessed yet. Okay, so that's just one big takeaway. Thinking about your digital products as meeting different segments of your audience, so tailoring those decisions. And then maybe thinking about jettisoning a few. Is it possible that if you let go of X digital product, you would survive? It's not really bringing in enough audience or it's not doing enough and you can take that energy and time and focus it and double down on the product that is doing really well? Just a thought. What about the fear of missing out? FOMO? Yeah. <laughs> what about it? Explain, well, explain the context of your question. I, I, I'm thinking of what Tim was talking about. You know, he, he, he's an experimenter, and, and, and I'm, I'm the exact opposite. I'm a lurker, but uh, oh. <laughs> but uh, I don't originate anything. I just lurk. But uh, but but I, I think in his business, if he's not if he's not talking about the, the newest thing that's coming along, yeah. he doesn't feel as relevant. Am I just putting words in your mouth? But would you think that to him a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, the fact is, uh, if you have really good content, we're not sharing that content, then people will know about it. They're already spending their time somewhere else, and we have to make sure that, that they can, we can bring them back to, to the source of where that's coming from. I think that's a really good argument. I, I would not say that it doesn't have validity. Yeah. What I would say is... And he's got a 30,000 feet jo view job. He, he, you know, he's, he's got multiple stations, multiple markets, and what's cool in Detroit might not be cool in Atlanta right. and that kind of stuff. Well, and I think you just think about your resources. You know, um, you know, given the context that you all are in individually, you know, this kind of discussion is very different. Um, but I have seen news organizations like just breathe when they let go of a product or two that wasn't doing that great anyway, and it wasn't really reaching the audience, and it was just such a time sink and a resource sink. You know, and I think, I think you know, we were talking about Bob and I earlier about mental health, about workplace culture, about all of these things. And I think it's wrapped up in that. We are trying to do all the things, and no one. Think about your personal life, right? I'm like a mom to two kids. Like I cannot do all the things. Sometimes I gotta say no, and then go watch my son's baseball game or football games tonight. It's football. <laughs> you know. So I think part of that is like the strategy behind this. But trust me, in my personal life great news source, we're constantly just trying to prep, right? I mean, that's what we do, but we're their students. That's what they're supposed to do, and then bring that knowledge to you, and then go, this is where you should invest. I think, I think for us, it really comes down, I mean, from the business side of things, we're trying to get as many people on our website and on our, primarily our news app. That's, you know, that's, that's where possible. most, the audience growth opportunities, we think, are. Um, and that's and, how you can sell it to advertisers. Yes, yeah, so that Facebook, um, Twitter, those are all uh, entry points Correct. for that. Um, and um, you know we, you know we balance that with their, you know they're typically younger people. I think in our newsrooms want to be. Um, I think there's almost like a culture of um, journalism that they want to be on all. You know, they want to be on Twitter. They want to be, you know, uh, on obviously Facebook and you know YouTube and uh, and and so it's trying to find a balance between how do you drive them back to where we're trying to be, right. you know, where our product is, our core product is, our you know our platform, um, and be in all these places and and you know one of the things we try to be is we're we're trying to have the reputation for being innovative. In our market, that's what we feel like is that's where the you know the future is. That's where people I think um, tend to you know gravitate towards. And that's going to build your brand if yes. you look like you're on the edge instead of way behind. Yeah, because we're I mean we're very much a you know a, we're a TV station, and I think you know historically clearly that's what we've been, and you know as our audience has. Um, you know, the younger audience, it's just not something that's a priority. They're, they're watching video when they want to watch it. They're not tuning in. So it's no. trying to strike this balance between bringing them into our 
website, onto our mobile uh, platforms. Uh, having to stick around. Right. Uh, video is a huge thing because we know, you know, and, and the video numbers are probably based on YouTube. Yeah. We just know that that's what people are consuming. So we think, well, that means they want to consume video on our website too. And we think that's probably true. But a, a lot of it's, a lot of the strategies I think are built off of what these social platforms have and, and are doing. Right. And, um, you know, it's, it, you talk about overwhelming your staff. I mean, I think I think most media, you know, companies that operate TV stations, they have different uh, ways where it's you know, uh, you hit this button and it goes out there. Right. So right. social flow, things like that. Yeah. I'll give you a real example of what Dave is talking about that happened this month. The time our news director was involved in it. I believe I'm getting this right, but we had a district. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. It. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he corrects me all the time. Uh, our district attorney. We have a district attorney under indictment. He's done it. It's an unbelievable story. It's a journalist story, um, and it just keeps me well. We had a judge come from out of the circuit, as you would imagine. <coughs> the judge allowed the live stream of the case. Our judges have been doing this, like you know, it's like. Good. He's gonna let us live stream, so we got the live stream. But our competitor, the, the two TV stations, both made the decision to live stream. Our competitor put theirs on Facebook Live. Our live stream was off of the website. Mm -hmm. We never put it on the social access, mm -hmm. uh, and we had less numbers, mm -hmm. but we had people that were going stay longer, stay longer. They were headed to our site, and, you know, and ironically. Yeah. Ironically, the Facebook live, uh, live stream got a mistrial because the witnesses were watching it in the witness room. Oh, well, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you do with something? Yeah, but so it wasn't our live stream. We could clearly say, oh, this was Facebook right. shares. This was their live stream. But so, and I just want to, like, yep, you're all right. You know, so, like, you know, I'm not here to give what you the answers, I mean, right? Yeah. I, so, I what do you do? Mark Zuckerberg's, you know, profit by Nobody I want, wants I want to make Facebook into, I want people coming to no, us. Right. That's what we're measuring on. But you so, gotta be there or you're... We have one reporter who absolutely loves Facebook Live. He gets tons and tons of views from it and sees that as a metric of success when we're back here saying, well, that article only got 1,000 views on the website. So we're trying to balance that. So speaking of metrics, I'm actually gonna jump to three and then we'll go back to two in a second. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we are finding uh, when we work with these newsrooms um, is that we are really focused on the quantitative analytics, right? Because we know how to find them now and they're everywhere. And um, I think some newsrooms are still stuck on page views. Um, I'm gonna argue that's super problematic because the page view number is really wily. Um, it doesn't mean that anyone actually read anything or liked it or engaged or accidentally just found it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's lots of different things there. There are lots of different metrics that are a little bit more useful. Um, I don't know, and I don't know how, geeky you are um, at, you know, at what level, um, but page views, this is a Google Analytics report that you can set up for free. Um, page views versus unique page views, those are two really big kind of compare contrast numbers, right? Who's coming to your site for the first time from an IP address versus who's been there before. Average time on page, I'm telling you what, that's one of the metrics that most people need to pay attention to. Um, you know, we're up at the two and three minute mark and I'm doing a freaking dance. Like, I'm like, this is the best data ever because we get below a minute and you're like, well, they didn't even look at anything. You know, that didn't even happen. Um, and then the bounce rate, right? So if anyone doesn't understand uh, bounce rate, which is how many times, or the percentage of your audience that goes to one story or one page and then bounces off the site. You want the bounce rate to be low, like a golf score, okay? Um, we are looking at these metrics in the morning meetings and training the kids on how to look at them and make sense of them and all of that. Um, and that's great. And I think just like education, we've gotten really into standardized testing when it comes to our newsrooms, right? We're like, well, look at your metrics. That means people like you um, or don't or think you suck. Um, and I think that's problematic. Like any set of quantitative data, a test score doesn't give your intelligence, nor does an analytics give your success as a journalist. Um, and so we're doing mixed method stuff all the time. Um, I'm a UX researcher on the side, uh, just for funsies, and doing some projects with some newsrooms on that. And I highly recommend, if you aren't doing it already, conversations with your audiences. Focus groups, 
surveys, how are they using their products, where are they reading your content, what do they wish they could do, click through, do they wish they could get the content right there and then maybe visit later, right? Those kinds of qualitative measures that we're actually good at because we're journalists, um, tell you so much about how to contextualize this stuff. I would argue you need to be doing the qualitative measuring of what's working and what's not working in your newsroom, so I'm kind of trying to answer your question as much as you're doing the quantitative monitoring. Quantitative is just super easy because programs do it and collect it and we can get it out in a spreadsheet and send it in Slack and then everybody knows, right? Well, it went viral this week. If you're not, yeah. So, in terms of newsrooms, I know we're talking a lot of the data everybody's speaking about is more of the kind of aggregate data that you just pull from everywhere and drive traffic. Right. So, what do you suggest for a section that wants to not be an aggregator for every news, but an aggregator of specific topics for audience that you're trying to reach that you believe that's underserved, that really wants that kind of um, news, but they don't see it because everybody aggravates this hot news. So how do you oh, create, so create a, a funnel of news that's aggregated for a specific audience that you know is there who doesn't have a tap or a low screen to tap on? So this is the best question ever. I have three thoughts. Okay, um, number one, um, no, shoot, lost the first one. Okay, but I'll get back to it maybe. Um, I I'm, I'm, was talking to the people at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution last week about unapologetically ATL. Have you seen that newsletter? Okay, so that maybe speaks to something in general. But it is their newsletter to target young black people in the city of Atlanta. And it is killing it. Their metrics are through the roof. And they were like, let's figure out why. And I'm like, let's. So we're gonna do a bunch of research, it's gonna be great. But that is an example of an email newsletter that's curated by two or three people with a specific voice, a specific audience in mind. It is targeting them and talking to them, with them, up, right, about issues that matter to that audience. Segmented kind of structures like that is kind of what I was calling for with that first slide where you think about your audience in that way, but I think those types of tools are the best. YouTube playlists, like verticals on YouTube, right, where you say, if you're interested in health news, right, this is where you go and all your stuff is there. Email newsletters. Um, you know, offshoot social media accounts that have kind of like a, a specific demographic. If you are interested in growing a certain part of your audience and serving them specifically, then that's, I think, how you do it, is you create a digital product that you know that those people are want to read or are gonna serve them in, in the issues that they want. Um, it depends on, the, you know, the segment. I think that's why that qualitative research is so important. You gotta get people in a room and you gotta be like, so what do you do? Where do you see your stuff? What do you like? We can do all this stuff that we want, but I think talking to your people is the most important and just grabbing them and be like, okay. Um, and we do a lot of UX beta testing kind of stuff when we teach our students where they'll create like a digital interactive and they'll sit down and the creator will keep their mouth shut. Um, if you've never done empathy mapping or empathy interviewing, that's the concept. And just someone off the street will look at their product and just talk through it verbally. Well, I don't know what this means. I think I would click here next. Okay, well, I would definitely never go here because this doesn't make any sense to me. It's not interesting at all. That kind of empathy mapping can give you volumes of information about what specific types of people want or need in a digital product. Um, so if you're developing that and you're trying to aggregate those people, yes. what do you suggest is the best way? Because we don't have the audience yet to do this. Yeah, and right, so it. chicken and egg. So <laughs> how do you aggregate those people so then you can ask them the question? Yeah, so I mean, your texting database, right? That's a good place to start. And we all have those kind of um, little pockets of whether it's, you know, subscribers or advertiser, right, or information. Um, I, I'm an old school newspaper person. Like, go to communities. Like, have often co coffee hours in a coffee shop and be like, our reporters gonna be hanging out here? Come talk about the issues that matter to you. I don't think that stuff gets a lot of attendance, but I think we can build a culture where communication and understanding what journalism is, I think we can start doing that. I think we should start doing that. Um, and I think that's where, on, sometimes on digital platforms, you will have people engage with you differently than you will in person um, and tell you things. I mean, there are people, stinking Instagram story polls do great. Twitter polls, no, nobody, nobody presses a button on a Twitter poll, right? But an Instagram thing, I'll go on those, shoot, yeah, right? I'll get some feedback on that. Um, and so I think using some of those types of tools to really understand your audience is gonna be important. I don't know if that helps. I feel like it's nebulous. I like we should like have coffee and talk later, but I'm, I'm leaving. I might also find a local influencer in that community that yes. you can partner with. You know, that sometimes that's a great point. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like influencer. Local influencer, somebody who's local oh, yeah. but has an audience already uh, so, on the digital side and partner with them for a, a meetup or something like that and you know launch a product with them and they get you know they get your promotional uh, you know what you can promote for them and they kind of get you in the room with their audience. Yep. Give we know certain stuff. people in Athens. If we send somebody to Mariah Parker or Mocha Jasmine Johnson, or you know, we, if we we know we're going to be talking to a certain group of people then, because if they're in the room, a certain group of people will listen. Mm -hmm. um, and that, yeah. I mean, I think if, if even if you're not banking on it in an advertising marketing way as a kind of an organic grassroots kind of building an audience thing, um, that can be helpful. It's such a good one. question. Um, so that's my pitch for quantitative qualitative. Um, I'll go back to number two real quick. Uh, we've already kind of touched some of these things, so I want to make sure, um, just in case. Uh, one of the things that I think that I'd like to see everyone do more on digital platforms is um, inviting the audience to speak. Um, let's just be honest, nobody really wants them to speak because they usually say horrible things. <laughs> um, you know, when, I remember when comment sections started taking off on our websites and I was just like, oh my God. You know, I mean, it's just, it's horrific in there sometimes. Um, but one of the ways that we really try to invite the audience in on social platforms is, is particularly on, on social media platforms, but it can do it in lots of different ways, is tagging. I don't know how much people are doing tagging. When we write any kind of post on any platform about the Athens Clark County Police, we tag them in it. Um, personally, partially, it is um, being transparent, knowing that they're going to see it. And so it's keeping us accountable in our reporting that we're doing it factually and accurately, but also allows people to click through and go to the Athens Clark County social media accounts and see for themselves whatever they want to see. Tagging is huge for getting your stakeholders into a story. Um, and you can do it in lots of different ways and lots of different platforms, but I just think it's something that we're just not doing well. We're just writing good social copy or good digital copy instead of saying, you're part of the story, I want you to come speak with us on this channel about this thing. Um, and tagging does that beautifully. Also, when I'm working with my newsrooms, posting inside of closed networks, that's where everything blows up, right? Inside Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got a blankety blank news, you know, for their, which, to be honest, they're stealing our thunder. It's problematic, right? Okay, we know that, but I'd rather us be the voice of reason coming inside there than anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay, got a question. I'm ready. These are good. So the um, so when you're streaming your um, uh, story that you were talking about, where we live stream. Mm -hmm. So whether we're uh, mm -hmm. doing a live stream story or we're using StreamYard, it, are there metrics that's associated with the chat rooms that are associated with the stories that are currently there, where people are in the chat box and they're, they're posting their comments during the live stream? Yeah. Is there any data that says, hey? That's a good feature to have. You should have that. The audience wants that. Or is it just kind of a cool thing to have? Yeah. Um, I have not seen conclusive data that it really works well. I think most people do not participate in those spaces because they are so public. And I think people are nervous about it. Unfortunately, I think your chances of getting something kind of wild and crazy in that space versus really thoughtful and interesting are about 50 50. Um, that being said, uh, I have seen it work well on our live broadcast. So we live stream our broadcast and we upload the whole freaking thing to YouTube. I know you all can't really do that, but we do because we're, you know, we're University of Georgia and we're taxpayer funded. Um, <laughs> we will have people, you know, comment about the show. Uh, we also do a live 30 minute post show critique, um, which by the way is just the coolest thing ever. Um, and so all the students gather back in the newsroom and we take the whole broadcast apart live on channel 181 and streaming on YouTube. And it is such a good experience, not only to show our readers, our viewers, that we're covering in Northeast Georgia, what journalism is and how it works, but also to allow the students to really be thoughtful and reflective. We get more comments on that section okay. than we do on the broadcast itself. People like seeing how the sausage is made. They really do. Uh, yes. Because you know why? Because journalists are so few in number now. Because it used to be, you would run into them at the grocery store and at the kids' ball games and stuff, and there's like four of us left, right? And so they don't know who we are. They just don't know who we and are. And they don't understand. I mean, there's been so much misinformation about how we do our jobs and the biases, the either real or perceived that we have. But you know, interesting, I made a the comment predecessor, I made an argument that we should, Facebook Live or some form, put our um, budget means, our planning means for the next shows out there. But, I mean, but that, 
we were doing it down in, anyway, go ahead. But it would Somewhere. create, on our side, because we have a direct competitor, okay, they um, were, you know, it would create a competitive disadvantage for us to do that, but I think that's, I mean, I just think people like that kind of stuff, and I think it leads to less people being critical of us in our news gathering and news reporting. Yeah. So that is if we're more open about how and why we're doing it. So a couple quick thoughts on that. Um, this is where digital platforms do shine. Uh, you know, and, and you being on TikTok is kind of part of this concept. We do something at News Source called reporter annotations. So once every two weeks, we have a, a reporter sit down with one of my grad students and talk about what they did and why they did it on a story. This could be an audio, video, Q&A, text format. We've done it in a million different ways. It is so widely read. Now, partially because people are coming looking for kiddos to hire, you know, or for us. That's kind of part of our audience, and that's who we're marketing to. Um, but also because people get to go, oh, that's why they picked that source. Oh, that's why they used that data point and visualized it that way. Oh, that's why. I'm working with a, an innovation team right now for the Cox Institute where we're going to work on developing uh, a system where you would have an article on a website and you would have little short video pop-ups of the reporter, just even vertical video, just going, here's why I did this. Getting to know who the reporters are, understanding how the sausage is made, providing transparency and credibility and accountability. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna beta test it next semester, so we'll see how it goes. Um, and I'd be happy to share it with you if it works. And you know, back to where you were last one, even the music stations, the radio stations can use that to, to, to get their personalities developed. That's, and that's exactly it. If we, if we present ourselves as real people, digital, digital tools are the best way to do it, right? Because we, and you guys all, we love the behind the scenes stuff on TikTok and Instagram with the anchors. Who doesn't love that? With the green screen, right? I think who doesn't love that? So um, I think ultimately we have, to, we have to be known. I think that's part of, I think it's part of the strategy. I think digital platforms do it better than any other tool. Um, we talk to a lot of students about um, social listening. So I don't know if that's a term you're familiar with. Um, if you have reporters do that, we use social news desk, but you can use Hootsuite, you can use TweetDeck, although that's only Twitter, so that's kind of a, a thing. But uh, there's lots of programs that you can use, and we have our students build dashboards um, to, uh, I went too far, I went too far! This is what's wrong with a fuzzy sometimes if you try to like go off script. Um, we have them build dashboards that allow them to track the conversations that are happening in our six counties that we cover. Um, and so Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are all on social news desks. We, we, we pay them um, to use this product for all of our Capstone students. And every morning while they're drinking their coffee, they're socially listening. So Which river's alive? That, that logo jumped out at I, I don't know. Uh, Jackson County, Georgia. Okay. That's where that's from. And don't worry, they found my cow. <laughs> I just want you to be not worried about that the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> um, but this is a great Was it missing or stolen? Right. Um, uh, uh, missing. Not stolen. <laughs> missing. Although they were not sure clearly at the beginning. Um, uh, I don't know the card. That's, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Phil would be proud of you. Uh, this kind of social listening can also lead to um, like a, a, a tonal kind of sense of what's working on platforms for people in that county. So this is one that's built for all the, obviously, sheriff's offices, right? But I've got tabs for lots of different things. And um, going through and seeing what conversations people are having and how to participate in those conversations, how to answer their questions, how to engage with them. Um, I will post as Brady News Source occasionally, be like, hey, can you tell us more about that? We would love to send a reporter out and talk to you about that story. And it's all coming from this social listening technique. Um, and so just, I would just make it part of a couple of reporters, if you've got a digital producer, if you've got a right part of their routine, um, to socially listen uh, and, and use that as a method uh, to tell good stories on social platforms. Um, this was actually uh, part of a package that one of our digital natives made. Um, and it was about live streaming. Um, coverage of events and how to start conversations with the community, getting them active online. They didn't do it during the live stream, like you were talking about, Tim, as much as around and before and after. Um, they found that to be more effective um, it, instead of during. So I, I don't know, with this specific news organization, that's what worked. Um, but encouraging responses and engagements, like who did you think had like, the winning moment in the game? Like, you know, who would you pick the MVP of this game? 
you know, in the high school sports, people got feelings, right? I mean, people got strong, strong feelings. And that kind of engagement allows you to build that network and personality. Um, let me just see if there was anything else on this number two list. What do you got, what do you aggregate, what dashboard do you use? This is called Social News Desk. Social News Desk. Yep, and it's actually um, the only one made by journalists. So that's why we use it. And we post from it, you can schedule out, um, and you can socially listen and monitor. Um, they also have a TV add-on. I know nothing about because we can't afford it. But um, it's supposed to do so something. I, it's oh, a, oh I, it, yeah. We used to have it. It was great. We loved it. Yeah, we loved it. We don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, there's your, there's your, uh, there's, now, Hootsuite can do a lot of the same things for free. Uh, in their basic plan, you can do social listening, you can post and stuff and, and, and schedule out content, and that's fine. Um, we just really like it, and right now we have some money laying around that we can use for this. So it's probably not gonna last forever, just like your life, just like you said. We talked about number three as far as analytics, quantitative and qualitative. Um, there was this really great thing that my digital natives did at Barnesville um, that was, it was, a, it was a, a social media series and a website series that was kind of meeting the journalists. The, these are the people out here in your community. Here's what they're saying and doing. And it was mostly video based. Um, you know, just really quick 30 second to a minute little hits. You know, here's what I'm interested in, here's who I am. You know, I've got a kid on the T-ball team too, or whatever. Um, and then number four, um, takeaways we've learned through this program and just through my time doing this research, uh, uh, digital is a long game, like the longest of the long games. And I think that's why it's so exhausting and it's so hard. Um, people who do run digital products are on 24 seven. Um, I've it's been there. Exhausting. It's exhausting. It's mentally exhausting. It's physically exhausting. And there is no direct, like, we're making this money because of this and most of these products. What we're finding, though, is that when you are building intentional, PAM driven, right, purpose audience and message digital work, um, you are creating what's essentially a culture for your newsroom as well as a brand for your audience that you're not just Nexstar or Bright Gray or you know, you're not just Cox Broadcasting Group, that your station, your people have a personality, have goals, um, and I think digital allows you to build that brand, that tone into your, and, and honestly, younger audiences, that's exactly what they want. I mean, like, in, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm like, who cares? You know, because that's <laughs> my general disposition, right? Like, that's just how we were raised. Any generation below me, they want it to be mission driven. They want it to matter. They want someone to care. They want personality. And not in a flippant way. I think a lot of people like, they're like, oh, what is it you're dating, you know? But no, they, they actually just want reality. They want real connection. Um, and I think that's what digital products allows us to give. And so if we think about it more than just delivering the news, but allowing them to be like, hey, you're part of the family. Like we're communicating to you. You're going to see long-term ROI on that. I can't promise it, by the way. Um, yeah. Are you Sorry laughing? for more uh, therapy, but um, <laughs> am I giving therapy or getting therapy? Uh, I, just, <laughs> I, I, see, I, I see this, and I just I'm like, I wish we do that. I wish we do that. Yeah. I mentioned, you know, next is wonderful company. I thank them for my job every single day. <laughs> okay. Provided a tremendous opportunity for me personally, but you know. You talk about what we push out. I mean, we have a station in Columbus, Ohio, and we get literally uh, Facebook posts on our on, under our header, you know, with Columbus headlines that make you think that you know three people just got shot in Columbus. And your audience probably gets it, it just is. I mean, and it's mm -hmm. from everywhere. And then then I add, you know, we have maybe some um, I'll just say some some liberal. Uh, um, Journalists, maybe out on the West Coast, or uh, were, you know, wrote, wrote a hypercritical story about Trump during the election. That shows up as a WRBL article. Fun and comment section. It should, yeah, and, I, and I'm bombarded with the, you know, the, well, this is yours, right? And I can explain. Oh, I know it's, it. Um, I, you know, and I, I have voiced in a general way uh, <laughs> my frustration no. about this, and that I get that, you know, with 190 television stations. If you take the shotgun approach, that you know you're probably going to raise all ships in in some ways, and I, I kind of understand that strategy. 
but just it, it's the opposite of localism, which is Correct. what our company is supposed to be about too. So, and it's just like, how do I, because Connor's got specific measurements, he's got to hit constantly. Is that right? Chuck and Crystal yeah. and yeah. Addison, their feet, they're doing their part to try to support that. Um, but at the same time, you know, this, this is, these are clearly better ways to do things. <laughs> and the quality, what we, we produce quality local digital content locally. But it's just like, it's just the noise it's of it inside. all. Well, and, and it's crazy. frankly, that's what audiences are pushing back. And we know a certain and segment of our audiences, they're checking out. It does. It does. It does. It does. It does. It down. It brings into question commitment on our side. To the local people. To the local people. Yeah. So, and, you know, and, I mean, I made the switch from newspapers to TV three years ago. Online was one of the reasons David and I thought it might work. And because I had a probably the highest paid producer newspaper at the time and it did translate I mean yeah you know, but my online stories are 70 percent of what they were five years ago I mean, but they're still meatier than anything else including some of the newspapers oh I, I know and, well and things are getting you know more surfacey and quicker right so let me just um again not a problem I can actually solve but <laughs> but I would love to uh what if you went rogue <laughs> and <laughs> um, just, just stay with me on like a product. What if you went rogue on a product? Now I don't know that you can like call it that. Like so, let's just keep that between us. Oh, it's mm -hmm. being recorded. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> what we, we, did, we did do that. Did you? Echo Box, and then corporate came back and made every single Echo Box for social pages, and then they came back and said, no, everyone use social flow. So there was a time we tried that and went rogue and spit. It so Echo Box, and it worked it? great. We got incredible traffic. Oh, that's another the idea. Is solid. Yeah. Okay, what's um, the idea? What is it? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so like, like, what if you create a product that is just for you, that is not part of the larger organization, right? And that specifically targets some certain people in your audience demographic who you would like to target, and you create it for them, like the unapologetically ATL newsletter, right? That's doing so well. Clearly, they're tapping into something. You know, would you have the leeway to do it or would you have to like you know massage some things around i don't know but i think to me that's the only way to get around what you're talking about because you can't stop them from pushing that national content out from other stations right um because they own the network that's fine but can you create something very intentional and very targeted for your audience and then perhaps use that as a beta test to say if we had a couple you know kind of specific local products, we could come up with a name and a logo for this strategy, and then, you know, make it work for that audience. Possibly. Okay, I'd so. Like to, I'd like to have some research that would tell me, you know, what is that audience? Because, so, I mean, the other thing we fight against is just the crowdsourcing. The, I'm gonna help you. The crowdsourcing, you know, that's already happened. You know, uh, we got a 15 year old kid in our market that, wow pretty much has taken ownership of breaking news. Mm -hmm. yeah, just yeah. through uh, a combination yeah. of Why crowdsourcing. Is an intern? It's really, it's crowdsourcing, yeah. but it's yeah. also yeah. anti-traditional media. Yeah. And it's those you, getting to tra you see you train him over we had, we had a producer challenge him when he said there was a shooting at a mall and the damn shooting didn't happen. There was a oh. rumor of a shooting. So he's got this out there. Oh, so he's isolated. And then he killed that, that a baby that wasn't dead. So, I mean, so yeah, there. Not no baby. But, but, but who caught the heat for it? It was us. Because we were was a liar. Because we, of okay. the fact she's like, wait, this isn't really true. Well, let Someone me just. Like, you know, we were happy baby. Yeah. Well, and nor yeah. should you do that either. He so, a group called the Australian's <laughs> Army. And they asked all this. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I, I, again, I don't know if I have enough context or help for that one. But what I will say um, is that that's the only way that I can see out of that kind of only national thing. We're hoping you'll start liking girls soon. Move <laughs> <laughs> on. Interesting. Well, his mama takes him to the sign. See, his mama drives him to break the sign. I cannot do that for my almost teen son. Maybe I should change my trajectory. Um, what I will tell you, uh, just a couple quick last thoughts, because um, we're almost out of time. Um, Consistency is key. If you didn't already know that, you probably do. But consistency is different on every product. 
Because Twitter moves super fast, you can post lots of things over and over again. If you do that on Instagram in a 24-hour cycle, people get annoyed. Um, you know, I think that thinking about timing is important on all of these digital platforms. I've definitely seen people who have sent out email newsletters too often or too repetitively or at a time that doesn't make sense. You know, um, and so I think thinking about time as part of your long-term brand decision is important. Um, also, one of the things that we do at Grady um, is something called solutions journalism. Uh, all of our students are trained in, in this method. Um, it's worth checking out um, as a philosophy that's supposed to kind of help balance your news coverage. So the idea is, in a very, very short version, it's rigorous reporting on the responses to social problems. So typically our news coverage is covering the social problem, right? Solutions journalism is not advocacy, it's not fluff. Trust me, it's really hard to do. Um, but what it is is taking that same investigative lens, how people are responding to the food desert issue or the poverty issue or the bridge issue or whatever it is, and reporting out who's trying to do something about it and the limitations of their response. We see solutions, I think we do research on this too, but research is showing insane growth for people who tackle solutions work because frankly, we're, we're so tired and we're so depressed. <laughs> um, and knowing that someone is making a little bit of a difference, not in a fluff like, ooh, the cat saved the baby kind of way, but in a, this is a systematic process that actually is making a dent in food insecurity in my county, what's working and what's not working about it. Um, that, is, that is good stuff for audiences right now. Um, so uh, we train our students in that, so if you hire them, they'll know how to do it at, at a basic level. Um, but just encourage you to kind of think about, you know, this is, um, you know, share your positive stories, right? Like nobody does that. Like nobody shares their positive stories. They only share their complaints. So sometimes we have to go out and be like, okay, like what's working? What, you know, instead of looking at the data set and look at the outlier where we're sucking, right? Let's look at the data set and look at the outlier where we're actually making progress and figure out what's happening that's actually going well here in this county and do the story there and really figure out why. Use good reporting principles to figure out why. Um, I think that's gonna start changing the game on digital platforms as well. Okay, so um, blah, 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 things and stuff. You guys were so like interactive that I'm gonna get to the point, which is, look, I have a slide for the point, that's useful. Um, we already talked about this. Um, I think the thing about digital that works well is you feel like you are intimate and you are part of um, your audience's daily life in a way that even a daily broadcast or, or um, a radio program doesn't necessarily have that same feeling always. Um, it is so, again, I just can't underline enough the word intimate. You know, digital content is intimate. It's, it's in my personal space and in my personal life and when I'm go, trying to fall asleep at night and I'm scrolling, right? It's, it's part of my identity in that way. And if you are with your audience consistently throughout the day, but in a very intentional way, in a way that is responsive to who they are and where they are and what they need to know, um, I think ultimately that's gonna be a benefit. Now, my, my five second pitch um, for how I can help you do that is this Digital Natives program. So there's the website, I have some cards if you're interested at the end um, with my contact information. But what we want to do is we have 15 slots we want to send a digitally savvy student to your newsroom for a week in January to help you achieve one of these digital goals. It can be big or little, um, but it is free training. We pay them and put them up for the week. They get to experience your newsroom and hopefully actually help you do something like physical and constructive um, that you can then uh, you know, share with your audience. The cool thing about it, I think, is that what we want to do is go back to the same newsrooms every year. And, and go again and again. And so if we send a digital native, they, they work on this cool targeted email newsletter, right? And they help you launch it. They come, then another one comes next year. And oh, how you been doing? What are the metrics looking like? How could we tweak this? Or do you want to do something else instead, right? Um, University of Georgia's journalism program, we like legit want to be in community news. Um, uh, I want to help community news. And we have a bunch of kids that are sharp, I mean, they're, and they're motivated, and they have so much energy, it's crazy. Um, so we would like to send them to you for free and have them help you uh, and get them out of our house. It's like little kids, right? They send the two-year-old to grandma's. Um, 
<laughs> so, if you're interested in the program, that's the website. My applications close next Friday, but it's a very quick Google form. It's just like who you are, what you want to achieve. Um, we'll take 15 news organizations and 15 students. That's what we have the funding for right now. Hope to grow it. And, um, Is there any way you can get to, can you get to a pair to come in and bring two in the one newsroom? Or do you think you're going to have all, all 15 slots filled? I think I'm probably going to have all 15 slots okay, filled, that's, that's but if you want to just put that in the notes and be like, I would like to, I mean, just go for it, right? Like, who, I mean, why not? We, one of the coolest things about what we do at WRDL, for me as, an, as a veteran journalist, is we are full of interns. We can, we've got them everywhere, and I just learned For his energy. To, uh, well, I just learned to, uh, to edit on Adobe because the two Auburn interns. But literally, they put the Auburn kids with me, and one in particular, yeah. Axel, and it's like, he was the proud parent the other day when he came to check a, a package out, and he's like, man, you got it all right, he's an audio. And well, and I think what's, what's, what's cool about this program, it's not some kids coming in for a report, and you got to find something for them to do, right? Yeah. This is somebody who's coming in to train you to do something specific, and they do two months of research beforehand. To get ready for that week, um, and so it's it's very much like a service based uh, concept. So happy to answer questions. You were lovely and asked horribly hard questions that I'm now having to contemplate all the way back to Athens. Um, but thank you. Okay, can I, just before we leave, I just want to remind people that uh, the, the, as a member service, we've signed up. Uh, six sessions with Al Tompkins. We've had two of them already, and the, the attendance has been bad, which means we're not communicating the right way to you all, because I know everybody in this room thinks Al Tompkins walks on water, and Pointer Institute is the gold standard in this type of thing. I believe it. But we've got uh, three coming up in November, December, and January. The first one's on storytelling, the second's about bias in the media, and the third, the third one is on misinformation in the media that he's going to talk about. Uh, it's cost you nothing to get this thing. His, daily fee for each one of these programs about five grand but we've got 30 states doing this so our cost was only a few dollars and the first two i'm just disappointed in the response somehow we didn't get the message you know, but if just the people in this room got on that thing we would be extremely happy about that well and i would just say i i get his morning meeting email i don't know if you al tompkins morning meeting and now it's just very COVID related the amount of story ideas in that one email every morning is explosive Highly recommend. I love Al Tompkins. I mean, he's just a genius um, when it comes to researching and telling good stories. So, yeah, I think that's cool. I found 